Well, I'm pretty much finished with the book of Ephesians. A lot of times I talk to people that haven't really studied the Bible all that much. And you could go to the Gospel of John, get salvation. And then you want to know a little bit more about the doctrines of the faith that are critical. You could go to the book of Romans. But I would start with the book of Ephesians. It's a shorter book, six chapters. It gives you a remarkable uh, list and instructions in the Christian life to follow. And I have some amazing texts that talk about eternal security and the assurance of your salvation throughout. Now, this is an observation stage. The purpose of the observation stage is to main focus, maintain focus on the text in hand in accordance with the framework in which it was written a framework which is defined by the normative rules of language, context, and logic, rules that we learn in grammar school, how to read properly. And these are rules which do not impose undue, unintended meanings to the text, and which largely limit the observer to the content offered by Paul's epistle to the Ephesians and his other writings. In, in order for any passage from elsewhere to be considered, including Paul's other writings, it must have a relationship with the context at hand in Ephesians, such as a scriptural quotation or a specific cross-reference in the passage at hand by the author, or an obvious contextual parallel. This will serve to avoid going on unnecessary tangents elsewhere, and more importantly, it will provide the framework for a proper and objective comparison <coughs> with passages located elsewhere in scripture. Remember that something elsewhere may be true, but in the text at hand, it may not be in view. It serves to confuse rather than to elucidate. Let's see if we can get a little bit better understanding here. Ephesians 1, 1 through 2. The NASB is one of my favorite verses, uh, versions. I look at 7. And I find that it and the New King James Version uh, modernize the American English to 21st century and provide a very good uh, flow of the context without editorializing. <clears throat> Paul, Apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and Laodicea and Colossae. Uh, the reason why I threw that in is that uh, one manuscript is the same identical book as the book of the, the letter to the Ephesians, and it goes the book, the letter to the Laodiceans. Evidently, this was uh, for all of those in the area that Paul had visited. Even that is to say, to the believing ones in Christ Jesus. Chapter two, chapter one, verse two. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So the first word in Ephesians 1, 1 a, the first word rendered Paul, emphasizes him as author of this epistle, Apostle of Jesus Christ Jesus by the will of God. You look at the interlinear here, it's a good way to determine whether a translation is uh, a good one a version like the uh, New American Standard. So Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints, the ones being in Ephesus, Laodicea, and Colossae, etc., in Christ Jesus. That is to say, the believing ones in Christ Jesus. You can get an interlinear online. Some of them are free. I have the uh, Complete Biblical Library. It's an excellent one with, accompanied by a dictionary and commentaries. The first word of the epistle is Paulos, rendered Paul. And due to its first position in the first phrase of verse 1, the name not only makes an emphatic point of declaring from whom the letter came, but the phrase goes on to, to declare that Paul is an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. The Greek word apostolos is not accompanied by the definite article, Hence, it may be translated in this context 
accompanied by the English indefinite article to indicate that Paul is an apostle as opposed to the only apostle, or sim just simply translated Paul, apostle of Christ Jesus. <clears throat> now the word apostle designates Paul as an appointed messenger of Christ Jesus by the will of God, he writes. <clears throat> Evidently the office of apostle that Paul holds by the will of God has to do with being a specifically appointed messenger, apostle for Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, as opposed to all believers who are messengers of our Lord in a general sense. The absence of the article with the word rendered apostle emphasizes having the office and characteristics of apostle of Christ Jesus through the will of God. The immediate appearance of the phrase Paul, apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in the epistle makes its declaration especially significant, one which authenticates the supreme value of the letter to its readers as coming from God to his chosen apostle messenger, Paul. Take a look at that. We have the apostle, a biblical perspective, and the word apostle is defined. It has a number of senses. In the case of the general sense of the word apostle, one sent with a message, and the specific by the will of God of Paul and the other apostles. You can read that for reference, but remember that any particular word, it has a number of meanings available to it, and it just, that particular meaning to choose from the dictionaries, it makes it available to the context more specifically. So the um, a number of manuscript evidences show apostle of Jesus Christ, and a number of other ones show apostle of Christ Jesus. This is uh, Comfort's book, the New Testament uh, commentary on manuscript evidence. The uh, Westcott Hort and the NU text has the support of the two earliest witnesses, P46 and B, as well as other diverse attestation. So we favor that. The differences are slight. Christ is the, the, uh, the anointed one. Jesus refers to his perfect humanity. The anointed one of Christ is referred to in the preferred manuscript evidence but it doesn't take away from the, his perfect humanity. They work together as the, the God-man. So the phrase Christ Jesus has an emphasis on the word rendered Christ, pointing to his deity and his anointed purpose from God when he took on the form of humanity with a view to his atonement for the sins of the whole world. Both work together. Neither one is really more important than the other. Part of the same being, the God-man, Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ. The Greek word Christos in the phrase on and Christo Iesu, rendered in Christ Jesus in the YLT, comes from the Greek word Krio, meaning contact, to smear, to rub, to anoint, or joyously bestow. And Krio is used to refer to anointing with oil for a particular purpose, such as being appointed to some position or office or function. So sometimes it refers to ceremonial. The Greek word Christos rendered Christ comes from the Hebrew word Mashiach, meaning the anointed one, which is given in Scripture and assigned usage, meaning in Scripture, which refers to the Messiah, Savior, ruler of the, all the nations of the world in the kingdom of God, who is to come yet into the world in the form of humanity, as he came in the first time, as an Israelite to deliver Israel and mankind from the bondage of sin unto residence in the eternal kingdom of God for those who trust in him who for it. So his first coming is in view, and his second coming will be in view. In Psalm 2, 1 to 12, why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, Mashiach, the anointed one, Christo in Greek, in Christ. Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heaven, in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. 
Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king, Hamashiach, on my holy hill in Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of, he, of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your pleasure. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. It speaks of future times when he comes again. Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way when he, his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. So there's a lot there. The psalmist asks why, in the sense of the futility of it, the nations of the world are in a rage, the peoples of the world, the kings and the rulers of the earth, vainly plot and take counsel together and set themselves against the Lord and his anointed. <laughs> take counsel together and set themselves against the Lord and his anointed. This is vanity, especially in view of God's almighty power and sovereignty. So the Lord's anointed is his chosen one to be ruler of Zion, i.e. the people of Israel, his chosen people with David, the first king in view. <clears throat> the psalmist declares that the kings and rulers of the earth in their rebellion against God and his anointed are saying, let us break their bonds in peace and cast away their cords from us. The nations, peoples, kings, and rulers of the world were evidently aware of the Lord and his anointed ruler of the people of Zion. They were enraged and consorted with one another to defeat God's sovereignty over them. It was their view that they were in bondage to the Lord and his king. Even then, Christ was there, the Hamashiach. But the psalmist declares that the Lord in heaven will laugh and hold them in derision. He will speak to them via his wrath and distress, then in via action that reflects his deep displeasure. The Lord declares that he has set his anointed king on his holy hill Zion. Yet future. <clears throat> the Lord Zion here refers to Jerusalem, which indicates that the Lord's chosen people are Israelites, whose anointed chosen one is their king. Zion was originally a Canaanite city, which was being conquered by David. The name Zion later on was used to refer to the temple area and then to the entire city of Jerusalem. The term Holy Hill is a synonym for the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and the Lord declares that his anointed chosen one has been begotten of God as his son. In view of the fact that the physical sonship is not reversible, so much the more is sonship to God irrevocable, and more so it is eternal, because God is eternal. God goes on to say to his anointed, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Even then, in the Old Testament, we have Christ coming in view. And an eternal kingdom. The phrase, you are my son, Psalms 2.7, comes from the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel 7.14. It is appropriated in Psalm 2 to show the legitimate God-ordained right of the king to rule. The phrase, today I have begotten you, refers to the day of one being anointed, chosen by God, to be king of Israel, the day of the coronation of the king and his adoption as a son of God into the family of God in an eternal life familiar relationship with God. It is implied that the anointed king of Israel being declared to be a son of God as a reception of eternal life and will receive an eternal kingdom inheritance to rule the nations to the ends of the earth and the future of the eternal kingdom. This is David. This also implies that the rebellion of the nations of the world toward the Lord and his anointed will finally be put down. In view of the lack of complete fulfillment of the prophecies in verse, verses 1 through 9, through David, King David, or any, other, any king after him so far, the context must jump out of the time of David to a future king of Israel, the anointed one, the Christ, from the Greek, O Christos, who will inherit the nations of the world and the errands of the earth, evidently as an eternal inheritance and possession. So the future anointed of God, the Christ, will meet the enraged nations, peoples, kings, and rulers of the world in conflict and break them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel, despite the warning of the Lord through the psalmist in verses 10 through 12. Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. <clears throat> 
blessed are